Hi, welcome. Um, if anybody's made a mistake, this is better living through stoicism. You have 30 seconds to leave the room if this is not what you're interested in. <laughs> Let me start by uh, countering one of the uh, stereotypes against stoicism, that we don't have fun. <laughs> wine, although as an Italian, I kind of object to wine in a can, but whatever. Uh, nobody's perfect. Cheers. So, uh, I got about 20 minutes to tell you how to live like a stoic. I wrote an entire book about it, so it's not going to happen. Um, what I thought instead I, is I will give you a little bit of a sort of a taste of what it is like, and, and I'll start by telling you how I got started. Um, so, a few years ago, I wasn't thinking about stoicism at all, and then I got on, on my Twitter feed, of all things, something that said, help us celebrate Stoic Week. And I looked at it and I said, what the hell is Stoic Week? And why would anybody want to celebrate it? Um, but I am a philosopher. I'm curious. I did study you know, ancient Greece and Rome when I was in high school back in Italy. So I said, oh, let's take a look. So it turns out Stoic Week is an event that happens every year. It's organized by the University of Exeter in England. Um, and it's done by a bunch of philosophers and cognitive behavioral therapists. That should tell you something interesting. Um, and basically what you do is you sign up on, the, on, the, on their website, you download a handbook, uh, and for a week you try to live like a stoic. And what does that mean? It means that you do some readings because you want to learn something about stoicism as a philosophy, presumably. Um, it means you do some exercises. They call them spiritual exercises. There's not much spirit other than... That's spiritual. That's a spiritual exercise. But it's things like meditation. It's things like keeping a diary about uh, uh, relevant things that happen to you during the day that have a sort of a moral, ethical um, uh, background or perspective and so on. And then you engage in discussions with others and you try to alter your behavior, to change your behavior uh, along certain lines. Basically, the goal is to become a better person. Easier said than done. Uh, it actually takes time. It doesn't, you don't do it in a week. But after, at the end of the week, I thought, um, uh, this was an interesting experience. Let me try to commit to another couple of months, because Stoic Week usually happens in October, early November. Let's, let's do this for another month and a half until the end of the year, just for the hell of it. And I thought it was very useful. I felt better about a number of things. So I said, let me commit to another year of doing it. And that's when the New York Times published my article, which is why we're here tonight, uh, called How to Be a Stoic, um, titled How to Be a Stoic. And here we are now, three years later, and I'm still doing it. So what exactly is it that we're doing? Stoicism is an ancient Greek and Roman philosophy. It started out around 300 BCE, so it's you know, 23, 24 centuries old, something like that. Um, if you don't know anything about Stoicism, let me tell you what it is not about because that's probably easier. If you think of a Stoic as somebody who goes through life with a stiff upper lip, that's not Stoicism. Or at least that is little s Stoicism and not capital S. It's not the philosophy. Um, if you think of uh, Stoicism as suppressing emotions, that's not what Stoicism is about. If your idea of a Stoic is Mr. Spock from Star Trek, that is not what Stoicism is about. Although, interestingly, Gene Roddenberry did, in fact, think up the uh, character of, Sp of Spock, uh, thinking of him as a Stoic. The problem is Jim Roddenberry did not know much about Stoicism, and now we're stuck with that thing. So this is not what it is about. What is it about is a couple of things. Um, as I said, it's, it's about improving yourself, trying to live a better life. For the ancient Greeks and Romans, not just the Stoics, um, the point of ethics was not to tell other people uh, what they're doing right or what they're doing wrong. A lot of mo modern moral philosophy is about, is this thing right, is this thing wrong, and things like that. Uh, the point of ethics was to figure out how to live a good life. And by a good life, they didn't mean necessarily sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's the Epicureans. Now, that's not true, actually. Uh, that's a stereotype and a slander against the Epicureans as well. But um, what they meant was a life worth living. They had a word for it, which is untranslatable uh, in English, and so I'm going to use the Greek word, eudaimonia. Now, often today, the word is translated as happiness. It doesn't really mean happiness, because if by happiness you mean, oh, I feel happy. No, that's not what it is about. It's not a state of mind, a temporary state of mind. Um, sometimes it's uh, translated as flourishing, 
as in having a flourishing life, a life in which you are able to pursue your projects uh, and you have enough freedom of action that you can do your things. That's better, but not quite, because then you know a psychopath could say, I, I, I want to pursue my projects and I live a eudaimonic life, and that, I, that, in, that is not a eudaimonic life. What it really is, is a life worth living according to a certain way of uh, 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 thinking about what life is about. The Stoics in particular thought that there are two things that uh, pretty much define human beings as a species. One, we are highly social species. Just look at you guys, right? We're here in a social environment. That means we depend on each other. We're very highly integrated with other members of our society. Right? So that's the first part. The second part is we are capable of reason. The fact that we're capable of reason does not mean that we're always reasonable. It does not even mean that we're often reasonable. And you can look at recent political events, uh, especially in the United States, and you can see that millions of people are not reasonable, uh, at least some of the times. But we're capable of reason. And so if, the, if these are the two things that define humanity, we're highly social and we're capable of reason. For the Stoics, what followed from that is that a good life, a life worth living, is a life in which you use your reason to improve society, to, become, to make this a better world for yourself and for, the others, for others. Uh, the Stoics rejected a dichotomy between selfishness and altruism. Today, we tend to think in, the, in these categories, right? So if I do something for myself, I'm kind of selfish. Uh, if I do something for other people, I, I tend to be sort of altruistic. They thought that whenever you do something for yourself, you're automatically doing something for society. And whenever you do something for society, you're automatically doing something for you, precisely because we are highly integrated social beings. So that's the general idea. That's what they were aiming for. The way they tried to get there, and the way modern Stoics, or modern practitioners of Stoicism, uh, try to get there, is by a couple of things. Um, first of all, you try to practice throughout your life, every day, four fundament fundamental virtues. The word virtue today kind of sounds funny. You, you tend to think about chastity, nothing like that. The Greeks were not chaste, and ne neither were the Romans. Got nothing to do with that. The four virtues are called, sometimes they're referred to as the four cardinal virtues. They are practical wisdom, courage, justice, and temperance. Practical wisdom is the ability to navigate complex situations, complex moral situations, to, make, to, to navigate trade-offs. So you want to be a family person, you want to raise your family, but you also want to have a good career. Okay, how do you balance these things? What is the best trade-off between these things. You want to be a good friend, but you also want to be you know, a good um, uh, teacher or a good um, employer and so on and so forth. Okay, how do you balance these kind of things? That's practical wisdom. Courage, it's got very little to do with physical courage, uh, even though some of the Stoics did things that were very physically uh, demanding. But it mostly has to do with the courage to stand up for the right reasons. So to um, speak on behalf of a co-worker, let's say, that is being mistreated, or stand up in defense of somebody who is being abused, or something like that. Which means that this is very closely related to the third uh, virtue, which is justice. Uh, today, by justice, we mean something like at a, at a sort of a societal level, you know, as in social justice movements and things like that. Modern, modern philosophers, moral philosophers, do think about justice that way. Uh, the ancient philosophers thought about justice as just what happens when you interact with other people. You want to interact with other people in a way that is just, meaning that it respects them as human beings, it doesn't exploit them, um, and it, it does it, you do it in a way in which you would want other people to interact with you. Okay, so it's justice in, in that sense. And then finally, temperance. Temperance means, of course, self-control. But not self-controlling sort of stifling thing like, as I said before, you know, suppressing your emotions or anything like that. Self-control is as in you do things in the right measure. Sometimes the right measure is you have to go all, all out. Okay? That is the right measure. Sometimes the right measure is you don't do something at all. Okay? And sometimes the right measure is you do something in the middle. So the Stoics famously um, said that they don't get drunk, but they do drink wine. That idea. 
So the four virtues, you, you, the idea is you practice these virtues every single day. Now, how do you do that? Think about every interaction you have during the day with a coworker. I'm a, I'm a teacher, so with my students or with my colleagues, um, with your friends, uh, with your significant others. Every single one of these interactions is an opportunity to practice all four of the virtues because you probably will be uh, faced at least once a day with a somewhat difficult situation. How do I manage these two things? That's practical wisdom. Uh, sometimes you will encounter a situation where you have to stand up s for somebody. That's uh, courage. Sometimes you will find a situation where you want to interact with a person uh, in a certain way. That's, that's got to do with justice. And very, very often you will find opportunities to practice temperance. Right? Um, very often. Um, so, so that's how you do it. And, and the way you um, practice day to day is you do certain exercises. Uh, the most important one that I do pretty much every day is uh, what Stoics call the philosophical diary. So in the evening, before going to bed, you take a few minutes, you, you focus on, the, on your day, you, you go over your day and the important things of your day, and then you write down a few lines in answer to these three questions. What did I do right? Because if you did something right, presumably, hopefully, you did, uh, it's okay to pat yourself on the back. It's like, good, job, job well done. This is one of those things that I need to do more often. The second question you want to answer uh, is, what did I do wrong? Because you probably did something wrong. Um, and there, the idea is not to beat yourself up and say, oh, I'm, you know, what a stupid idiot, I did something wrong. It's just to learn from the experience. Is to say, okay, that was actually not a good thing. Uh, that's one of the things I have to put on the list of not doing it again or doing it better. Which brings me to the third question. The third question is, um, what could I have done better? The reason to ask yourself that question is because our lives are actually typically far less diverse and, and adventurous than most people maybe think. Every day we do the same things. Okay, you get up, you go to work, uh, you do certain things, you come back, you go you know, grocery shopping, you prepare dinner, whatever it is that you do, it's pretty much all the same thing most, of, most days. Which means that very similar situations will occur over and over and over. So the first time around, if you do something, if you don't react well, the first time that something uh, difficult happens, that to, difficult to deal with happens, okay, you get a pass. But then you reflect on it and you say, okay, the next time I'm gonna do it this way, that way, the second time, the third time, the fourth time, the fifth time, you're going to do it better and better and better. So it's all about self-reflection. It's about critical analysis. Now, the problem with critical analysis, with self-critical analysis, is that we're so good at rationalizing things. So Aristotle famously f said that uh, human beings are the rational animal. Modern psychologists would tell you that we are the rationalizing animal, meaning that we can make up easily excuses for ourselves. Uh, why did I do that? Well, because after all, there was a good reason. Now it actually felt good, whatever it is. So that means that in order to practice Stoicism or practice anything like a personal philosophy of life, um, Stoicism is very, very similar, actually, as it turns out, in terms of practical exercises and practical way of doing uh, to Buddhism. I actually think of Stoicism as the sort of Western equivalent of a Buddhist practice. It's very similar. Uh, there are similarities with other philosophies uh, in the Western tradition as well, like existentialism, for instance. Um, part of the practice then is, however, because we rationalize so easily, is you get a buddy. Just like you, when you want to go to the gym. I don't know ab about you, but when I go to the gym and the nice person across the counter says, enjoy your workout, I want to smack him. I don't enjoy my workout. I don't know what you're talking about. I do it because I have to do it. It's good for me. It's long-term thinking. Um, but no, I don't enjoy it, right? So what do you do when you, when you have to do something you don't enjoy? You, it works very well if you pick somebody else and say, can you keep tab on me? Can you help me go to the gym every day or three times a week or whatever it is? Uh, when you're on a diet, the same thing, right? If you do it with another person, it's easier because the other person checks on you, you check on the other person. The Stoics realized that 23 um, centuries ago, and they thought of a different ways of getting a, a buddy to practice your virtues. Um, they went all the way from actual physical friends to sort of imaginary friends and to role models. 
so for instance, if you have an actual person that practices with you, that's great. Uh, you can exchange notes. You can say, yeah, actually, that behave today you really did okay. You could have done better. You can also square your own behavior, your own practice, your own progress with uh, role models. So think about somebody you know, either that you know personally or you know enough of, that is a good person. And you say, hey, that I should try to act more like, I don't know, Nelson Mandela, just to pick a, a low bar, right? Now, that doesn't mean you have to move to a place where there is an apartheid government and, and spend 23 years in prison uh, uh, to overthrow, overthrow that, that government. That's, that's asking a lot of a person. I mean, some people do it, like Nelson Mandela. By the way, Nelson Mandela was influenced by a very uh, short and, and uh, incisive book that uh, was smuggled in prison when he was uh, uh, under the apartheid um, government for many years. And that book was The Meditations by Marcus Aurelius which is one of the founding texts of Stoicism. So Stoicism, you find Stoicism actually more places you might think of, even though it's a somewhat considered as, uh, esoteric uh, philosophy. Okay, so Nelson Mandela, it's a great role model, but that doesn't mean you have to behave like him. What that means is, however, that, let's say, thank you, I got five minutes. Uh, the next time that, um, I don't know, you walk by a homeless person without saying hi because you feel embarrassed, for a stoic, that's not a just thing to do because you're not treating that person as a human being. You're avoiding him or her. Uh, so think of Nelson Mandela and say, okay, if Nelson Mandela was able to spend 23 years in prison to overthrow a government, I can surely manage to say hi to somebody I don't know. Even if that's the only good thing that I do today, that's pretty good. That's better than yesterday. Right? The goal is not perfection. Seneca was one of the um, ancient uh, Roman stoics. And he wrote a number of letters to, his, to one of his friends, Lucilius, who he was using sort of as a, as a buddy for that reason. They were using each other as a buddy for that reason. And in one of these letters, uh, Seneca says, look, I'm not trying to be perfect. I'm just trying to be better than yesterday. And if we all try to be better than yesterday, this would be a hell of a lot of a better place, I think, very, very quickly. Um, if you don't succeed, let's say you slide a little bit, right? It's like, oh, yesterday I actually did improve, but today, boy, I did that thing. It just doesn't, doesn't compute. It's not, it was not very virtuous. It's okay. Stoicism is a very forgiving philosophy, forgiving of others. You don't go around beating other people on the head and say, bad stoic. You're not doing the right. <laughs> that's, not, that's none of your business because it's their business. If they want to be helped, you help them. But you don't go around saying, ah, bad thing, you know, you beat him on the head. Um, and the reason for that is because of another one, and I'm probably going to close on this one, of the fundamental ideas of Stoicism that it's very practical. This is called the dichotomy of control. The dichotomy of control, as Epictetus, one of the uh, foundational uh, philosophers of Stoicism, said, is some things are up to you and other things are not up to you. And then, which seems pretty trivially true, right? I mean, obviously some things are not up to me, like the weather, for instance, it's not up to me. Um, other things are up to me. I, I made the decision to accept the invitation to come here tonight and talk to you, right? But he meant something a little more profound than that. He basically meant that the only thing that is truly up to you is your judgment. It's your decision-making process. That's pretty much it. Everything else you can influence, maybe, but it's not entirely up to you. It's, you don't control it. So, for instance, most people think that they control their body. Oh, I, 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 can, I can go to the gym. I can eat uh, healthy food. I go to the doctor every year and my checkup. Yeah, that's very nice of you. And then a virus strikes you and you're done. Um, or then you go skiing and you have an accident and you break a leg or, you know, whatever it is. That was not under your control. So influencing something, like m trying to make your, your body better, uh, or healthier is definitely up, up, uh, up to you. Your, the decision making is up to you. The outcome is not. And that's a crucial decision. When you try to talk to somebody else, let's say, try to change their opinion about something, have a discussion about politics, let's say just a random topic, Trump, for instance, <laughs> right? You never, go, as a stoic, you never go up to somebody with the idea that you're gonna change their mind because their mind is up to them, it's not up to you. It is their judgment. You don't control their judgment. You only control your own judgment. What you can do is you can talk to them, you can try to persuade them, you can engage in a discussion, but always with this idea that the outcome is not up to you. Which means 
This is applicable in general. It's a very powerful idea. You always try to do things by internalizing your goals. You never try to actually achieve something. You try to do your best to achieve something. So I want to be, uh, I want my, my partner to be in love with me. No. You want to be the most lovable person for your partner. Whether she loves you or not, or he loves you or not, it's up to them, not to you. I want to get a promotion at, uh, to, at my job. No, you don't. You want to be the best person to deserve that promotion and do whatever it is reasonable to do to get that promotion. Whether you get it or not depends on a bunch of other things. So when you actually internalize that, it's a very um, important source of personal freedom. Because at that point, slowly, day after day, you stop worrying about what's going to happen. You only worry about what you can actually do about it. You only worry about your locus of control. Everything else is like you let it go. You try, and I'll, I'll leave you with this metaphor that makes, I think, the, the, it's a very nice metaphor. It makes the point very clearly. This is from Cicero, who was not a Stoic, but uh, was very sympathetic to the Stoics. He thought, imagine an archer who is trying to hit a target. Right, like an enemy soldier at the time, since he was an, uh, Roman. Um, what is under his control? Uh, he has uh, practiced as much as possible to hit the target. He has chosen the best arrows and the best bow that was possible. He's focused up to the moment in which he lets the arrow go, and that's it. After the arrow leaves the bow, it, nothing is up to the archer anymore. Uh, the enemy soldier may turn at the last minute, see him, and duck, and that's it. You're done, even though you're the best archer in the world. Um, a, a gust of wind comes in, and that's it. It, it undoes all your, all your efforts. But if you are practicing a stoic, you'd say, well, you know, I prefer to hit the target, but really what I'm focused on is to try my best to get the best shot possible. Thanks very much, guys. I think we're out of time. Mm -hmm.